couple of other organizational things uh, before we get started. Uh, for those of you with your own transportation, uh, for to UCI's office for this afternoon's poster session and reception, there are maps out at the registration desk with uh, directions on how to get there. Uh, for those students here, uh, uh, the posters, uh, there will be ample time at the end of this session between, say, 4.30 when the session is over and 6 p.m., there will be ample time for you to, uh, to go a little bit early and put your posters up on the poster boards. Uh, and then uh, laboratory tours, we're probably going to start about 6.30, 6.45, for those of you who wish to, uh, to tour our new laboratories. This will give our employees the chance to uh, start out at the reception and, and see some of the posters and to, uh, to talk with you. With that, uh, I'd like to introduce our chairman for this afternoon's session. He is a, a director of the Tri-State Catalysis Society, Steve Augustine. His company is now Millennium Petrochemical Company. Those of you who uh, are familiar with them may uh, remember them as Quantum and several other names. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, if you would please. Well, good afternoon. Um, I, like Carl, when I learned I was going to be a chairman, asked about what my requirements were. And I should have asked Fred, but instead I asked Pat. So instead of having one requirement, I have two. One is to keep everything on time, but the second one, which I think is going to be much more difficult after the big lunch we had, is to have a nice stimulating discussion. So I'm going to ask you all to do your best to stay alert and so we can continue the discussion through the afternoon and you can keep me up for getting into trouble with Pat. So to begin, we have uh, Dr. Ziadong Zhang from the Center of Applied Energy Research at UK. And his talk will be the effect of vapor liquid equilibrium on Fisher Trope production dist product distillation. And Dr. Zahn's co-author is Herb Davis. This is a typical chrysotrope synthesis reaction. Typically, CO and hydrogen react to form some kind of surface chain intermediate. Then for any for any chain in intermediate, it can propagate to heavier hydrocarbons. It can terminate as a halogens or olefins. So. It's gener generally we just model the concept in <coughs> generally we borrow a concept from polymerization. We define a propagation probability, simply we call that alpha. That's the rate of propagation over the total rate. So if alpha is a constant, this is the product concentration in the product is reducing in the product. Uh, in polymerization, is this alpha is a constant? It's not a function of carbon number. But in freezer trom it, there are numerous experiments so that alpha is not a constant. It's, a, it's actually a curve. So at this break point, it's about around 
17, so the carbon 8 to carbon 14. So we call that positive deviation from single alpha distribution. So for, for this product distribution, for over years people are arguing about the why the alpha is not a constant, it's not constant. It's a, it looks, alpha is a function of carbon level. So several models have been proposed to explain this deviation. For example, uh, some people propose that there are two active sites on catalyst surface. So one responsible for low alpha and the other one responsible for high alpha. This one considers the active sites on catalytic surface. Another one is the diffusion and hence the oligonary absorption. This model talks about the, because there's diffusion difficulties, olefins don't diffuse out instead of they reabsorb on catalyst surface. This one this model talks about the effect of catalyst decay. Another one is the thermodynamic effect. Uh, this is a reactor effect, another physical effect. So all of them assume the real reaction is a single alpha bond because of some other physical factors. We, the product we collected is not representative of what is produced. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is the thermodynamic effect. As I mentioned, the VLE model considers the effect of the reactor, especially in CSTR operation. In a CSTR for physical form, typically high friction and CO flows in continuously, and vapor phase product can flow out continuously. Of course, because of the vapor liquid equilibrium, some reaction product appear as liquid phase, they just accumulate in a and it's actually a black box. You have to I just show you some e equations. You have to trust in my mathematics, my <laughs> programming skills. So actually in this result talk, this is vapor liquid separation system. This one I just uh, make up a system, binary system we assume initially there is A0 amount of A component and B0 in the, the time and continuously we flow component A and of course some component A flows out and some left over in a liquid phase. So when a, when a liquid level is higher than in the initial one, we turn the extra liquid and add that to the vapor. The objective of this one is to see if there is any change that a in the output, that the vapor flux liquid could be higher than that in free. If it's yes, we can say in freezer shop synthesis, we are going to have two alpha distribution. And also we need to, in this one, we just need to assume the density of liquid phase is constant just to simplify the discussion. So in this, system we during any time interval we if amount of air flow system is not necessarily in thermodynamic equilibrium not necessarily ideal because we talk about some amount that is over on so we have two schemes to two cases to turn liquid we can allow liquid to accumulate over a time period for example, 24 hours and then turn it. This is something like a saving phase of the reactor. Or we can turn uh, the liquid instantaneously with the liquid constant. So we can uh, we'll look at that separately. So 
Actually, initially we have some the total is some liquid in the reactor tank and that are the end of T time T1. F is the input and B1 is the output delta 1 is the material left over in the liquid. So the total liquid phase in the tank will be this amount and the concentration. So we, we just say keep going to Ti, we, you know, we get a concentration of A in the liquid phase. So at the end, at the end of any time Tn, for example, at the end of Tn, the total vapor phase collected is the summation of Vi, this is F in is the total free and delta, summation delta I the total A accumulated in the liquid. And we are good. Uh, the total amount of H from liquid phase we need to train is of course it is the amount and time concentration. So the total A in the total is this amount. So we have four cases here. The first one is the, if there is accumulation of A in the liquid phase, delta I summation greater than zero. We always get F out, always is less than F in the neighbor plane. This is always negative deviation. So when there is no accumulation, the system reach equilibrium, F in equals F out. So we see a single alpha observation. But when the accumulation is less than zero, that says the reactor is drying up. We are going to get more material in the output then in the free. We, get, we are going to get two other observations. But as I said, this two other observations is not real. It's under abnormal operating conditions. So when the data summation data is less than zero, there is a drying out, but the total amount is close to the initial liquid, um, amount of initial liquid in a tank. F up we approach infinity this is the reason we see a hump in our simulation and the alpha greater than one kind of thing. So if we take the sample instantaneously, we we can do similarly to what we did and eventually we come up with this one. This F is the width F. I is the output at PI time. We get this equation and we are going to get a similar inclusion as, as I said. So from this work, we have only one conclusion on that wave liquid separation is not responsible for the two alpha observation in two such Thanks. Time for questions? <coughs> I've got a question for you. Um, the nice thing to do with, with uh, calculations is always try to verify them with, with the experiment, but I can see that the difficulty because you have a story and you're building up, you're not only building up your solution, but you're changing the molecular weight of the solution because you're putting in long chains uh, liquids. Can you think of a way that you could design, say, a reactor that you would not build up uh, those long chains? Or, or if you did build them up, you would hit a steady state at some yep. point. Yep. Good question. <laughs> Or hit a steady state with, say, with the other. Uh, yes, say for example, in a fixed plane reactor, which that's similar to triple band, there will be base accumulation. Okay. But um, there also there to report, people report there is some mass transport problem. Okay. So do they get different two alpha distribution in a fixed bed than you would in a CSDR? 
Yes. So in 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 circle bed, in fixed bed, there's always a little hole down, but the amount it is less than that is just just they are. Okay. Uh, anyway, this is a, this is a people have been arguing about the different models. This one said this word, that one said that word. But according to our recent review of these models, we think a no model. So I'm just trying to stop. The for, for this stage is to show you VLE is not the one, it's not a candidate. <laughs> so are you going to give us a clue as, as far as the next model coming out? Or <laughs> next one? Well, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>
in order to be know God knows the different circumnation, we use some different deorumination uh, method. Uh, for the centoil and the beta zeolite, we use the hydrochloric acid. And for the modernite, we use the ammonia hexafluoride silicate. And you can see the first thing, they are pretty good, particularly for the centoil, even all the very severe acidic, acidic, you know, acid concentration, the first thing really is always still the same. And acidity, as you expect, is very important for the hydroassimilation reactions. So in order to characterize all these uh, zeolites, we use both FTIR and uh, TBT experiments. But we do some small modification for the TBT experiment. As I'll show you here, we call it STBD, which is stepwise uh, temperature program desorption. And in this TBD, STBD experiment, which is slightly different from conventional TBD, is we use five different temperature range. And this is a temperature profile we, we got in after a lot of tries. And we start at 150 degrees, so we exclude any possible physiological of ammonia. And end up at 540 degrees, so we don't destroy the zero structure. And from this TBD experiment, we got uh, this type of response. And you can, as you can see, we got five distinct uh, peaks. And we, they related with different strains of acidic sites. But from this experiment only, we do know uh, which those pick of we see dissolution are from Bronstein acid sites or Lewis acid sites. So in, order to, in order to do this, we, all, we also did FTIR measurements at exactly the same temperature profile. As you can see here, we have those temperatures which is exactly the same as we use for the TPD experiment. And from this experiment, we, we know at the peak, <coughs> at this position, at 1625, which corresponds to lowest acid size, and at 1454, which corresponds to absorption from bronze acid size. By a calculation or the interpretation for those peaks, we can know the area change for the different temperatures. So we, we can trace back whether you know, those dissolution in TPD are from Bronstein acid sites or Lewis acid sites. For example, here, for this one, which is uh, over this one, 12, and the peak area here is almost the, the same. Thus, we, can, we conclude that all the, all the acid sites over this one, 12, actually, the, the pre, if I turn back to the Previous ones for this one 12 here, all the dissolution are from bronze stain size, particularly, particularly for the de-aluminated this one 12. Those we can quantitatively know whether how much, how much amount we, ha we, can, we have for bronze stain or low stain size. Because those TBD experiments are, are ex extremely reproducible. As I, as I can show you some more bigger if I have time. And then I got uh, this bigger table. And first one, I have uh, this some 12 here. And something very interesting is when, when we compare it, three zeolites here, which I highlight with the red in color, uh, which is for uh, this, this some 12, 35 means this some 12 with silica aluminum ratio over 35. And the uh, just Y28, uh, which is the uh, just Y uh, with a silica aluminum ratio over 28. And also, if you compare it with the modernite 36, which is the modernite with a silica aluminum ratio over 36, uh, here is the actual silica aluminum ratio. As you can see here, uh, those zeolites give us very different acidic characterization. Particularly, the, the here is the ratio of Bronstein to Lewis acid size. For this one 12, particularly, this is the aluminum with all of them are bronze acid sites. And for, the re for this ratio, if you look at the uh, ultra system Y28, the ratio is about 1.46, and for modernite, it's 5.9. And the last column here is the TB, which is actually the average dissolving temperature from the bronze acid sites, which is a kind of indication of the strength of bronze acid sites for this particular zeolite. So as you, you can see here, 
modernized and it's more strong than Artistic Y and uh, and this and Toil. And something you know, also interesting which I want to uh, point out is here the ratio between the number of ammonia size absorbed over the number of aluminum atom. The ratio, as you can see here, for this and Toil is about one. So for each aluminum atom, we have one absorption. Point, uh, for the ammonia, and however, over ultrasound Y, you see here, for the ultrasound Y 2.6, this is silicon ratio 2.6, the ratio here is uh, well below than 1, it's about 2.24. And this is the same case for the high aluminum zeolites, or air zeolites, LTL 3.8, the ratio is so also very low. So this means the acceptability of aluminum size for the, for the reaction is very low. So if we use this, Alumina number as a some reaction type uh, standard, so it can be erroneous. And from the uh, cabinet of chemistry for the isomerization reaction and hydro reaction, reactions, so with the two types of isomerization reactions, this is just some uh, brief introduction. And type A isomerization, which changes the position of side chains, so rather than there, we keep the same number of branch, but for type B isomerization, which will either increase or decrease the branch. And there are also five types of beta station reactions. I think the first type A beta station, which is starting from a tertiary carbonyl ion and end up with another carbonyl ion, which is easiest and the easiest and fastest beta station reactions. And there are some other type of beta station, like type B, starting from a secondary carbonyl ion to end up with a primary coming out, so it's uh, relatively difficult. And the relative rates of this uh, isomerization and the cracking steps have been you know, studied in the uh, past several years. And uh, it was found that the hydrogen shift is the fastest one, then dense type A beta station and type A isomerization and type B isomerization and so on. And based on this knowledge and the particular reaction for the normal octane, we can write down this uh, reaction scale for so the isolation process is typically in this vertical way, as you can see, starting from a normal octane, where we get the model branch of the octane, uh, actually it's a uh, uh, it's methyl heptane, and then we have dimethyl hexane and uh, trimethyl uh, pentane, uh, which is uh, by a type B isolation, or we call a uh, protonation cyclone propane mechanism. That's why I use a uh, triangle here. So, and in parallel, we have a type A isolation, it's a very fast reaction, so by this reaction, uh, all types of uh, branched products were finally produced. And at the same time, there is also you know, irreversible, uh, I mean, irreversible uh, cracking reaction, which will produce uh, cracked products. So in this, uh, since we have this type of reaction scheme, we should be able to uh, trace back you know, what type of reaction maybe in our plane law if we uh, analyze the product distribution both the isomer products and the cracker products. And first of all, uh, here I show you the comparison bit, bit, uh, among uh, different types of zeolites. Uh, when obviously those uh, uh, different types of zeolites show very different types of behaviors or I mean the activity. Yeah, as you can see this um, toil is uh, even though it has a much high silicon aluminum ratio, so a low acid, acid concentration, so it's still most uh, active, or it's more active than beta zeolites, and uh, certainly ultras to Y. And if we do a more objective comparison, we calculate the turnover frequency based on three di different uh, definitions. The yeah, first one, first column here is based on all acid size, actually it's uh, all ammonia dissolved in the molecular numbers, based on this. And this one based on the bronze acid size numbers, and then the last column is based on the aluminum atoms uh, from chemical analysis. And as you can see here, for the, the three zeolites which have comparable silica aluminum ratio, uh, as I've already shown you in the uh, acid, acidity characterization, here, uh, this toil uh, is still, you know, whatever the you know the standard you use, this one, this one, 
or is it? It's, it's all, all, you know, always the most active colors. I can see here, this is 28.3, so it's about uh, six times uh, more active than modernite, and it's certainly more, uh, more active than ultra-stable white. And for the ultra-stable white, 2.6, and the uh, uh, LDI, as you can see, although they are numerous in alumina content, but it, they are much less active than, uh, than the SM12 and other of the beta zero line. So this tells us uh, the alumina amount or concentration is not, not most important for the reactions. And here, so another reason you, know, you want to probably explain why we observe so much difference, you probably have very different uh, acid strengths. But I, as I'll just show you, and actually modernite is, uh, you know, the acid strength is more, uh, more strong than this than 12. So, it's obviously uh, this difference cannot be explained by either uh, acidic strength or acidic, acidic amount. So this simply must be related with a particular their structure. And as I uh, mentioned, uh, from the product distribution, we should be able to trace back what type of reaction mechanism are pretty low for, the, for any particular reactions. For this, for this reaction here, I show you the normalized uh, monobranched product uh, distribution, which is uh, methyl heptans and uh, three ethyl uh, heptans. And those four are only uh, monobranched products, products from uh, normal often reaction. And the one result we can obviously say uh, we know, and we, are, uh, we know those. Uh, Monobranched products are produced by type B action position, or we say T2P reaction mechanism. And but as you can see, the product distribution, you know, or whatever the are products you have, the, the distribution is different from prediction from the T2P reaction mechanism. You, as you can see here in this green color, the T2P reaction mechanism will predict 25% of two and 50% of three and 25% of but in reality, the product distribution, as you can see, is more approaching the equilibrium, as you can see here. So, this, uh, this is, uh, we have some reason actually, because we have relatively high temperature and uh, relative uh, uh, high conversion. Probably you want to say why you choose such high conversion or temperature, because we want to do, you know, not only ask relation, we also want to study uh, fractions. <coughs> And this is true, if we go very low temperature and uh, very low combustion, the product distribution will follow the predicted from the PCP reaction mechanism. And another point that I would like to say here, as you can, when you compare it between the same group of uh, zeolites, although, the, like, like uh, this 12, although they have different silica aluminum ratio here, so however, the product distribution is uh, very similar. So this means uh, the silica aluminum ratio uh, not, uh, uh, does not change the, pr the product distribution. So uh, the product distribution is uh, actually uh, governed by the equilibrium as such a condition and the uh, conversions. And the uh, last point I want to say on the table is you can see due to, due to relative big size for the ethyl hexane, uh, its amount is uh, less than <coughs> prediction from the equ equilibrium. And even on the radical zeolites or just Y, so this uh, is a, is a means uh, even over radical zeolites, there is still uh, division of resistance or uh, transition state intermediate uh, resistance. And those who pro produce the monobranch process may go further uh, reaction which will produce the dimethyl hexes. And as I show you here, for this reaction scheme, all different types of uh, dimethyl hexane can be produced by this uh, uh, PCP reaction mechanism. And thi although we cannot say you know, uh, exactly how much we can produce because this weight for different uh, loads are probably different, but this, this gives us better, some uh, ideas uh, what, what type of products we may have. And I'll show you next in this transparency here for the dimethyl uh, hexane product distribution here. 
basically the product distribution is still approaching equilibrium. However, some other imposed effects are also you know, uh, occurring here. As you look at this column here, total dimensive hexane and 33 dimensive hexane due to their relative big size uh, when during their formation, so their concentration um, are much less than the predicted from equilibrium. And when you know unpredicted uh, result is the very high concentration we have for the two three dimensive hexane, as you can see here, it's um, more than doubled uh, when compared with equilibrium. And actually, this is, can be explained by the previous uh, transparency of the or I would say the reaction mechanism, as you can see here. Particularly, as you can see, uh, due to relative difficulties for the formation of 3 3 dimensional hexane and 2 2 dimensional hexane. So, some, more, some of the reaction loads are suppressed. For example, here, starting from the formation of hexane, so the product, final product may you know, all become 2 3 dimensional hexane. So, this explains why we get the relative high concentration for the 2 3 dimensional hexane. And now, uh, let me discuss the product, uh, uh, product products. And we know all those primary products are coming from uh, beta switching reactions. And here, and, uh, I went through very tedious procedures to write down all possible uh, beta switching reactions for all those possible carbonyl ions. Here, first one here, the, uh, from tri-branched uh, optic carbonyl ion, and this is uh, type A cracking, uh, as we know, the very famous, in which were produced two isobutane finally. And we have uh, there are also B, B1, B2. And as those are most uh, energetic, energetically possible beta switching reactions. So when you're starting from this one, you can also set up a cracking, but uh, this one be, be more favorable. And then uh, we also list here for the dibranched optic carbions. So those, when those different products, so the different products can be produced from specific uh, reaction loads. And there's, there's some more here, probably going to feel pretty tedious here. And we we have, you know, if we start from a monogranged carbonyl, so we have those three, four most possible ones, and the last one from normal optic carbonyl ions. Since they are deep for velocity, so usually it's not so favorable, and that's the relative high temperature. And based on this, if we, just, if we you know, concentrate on the concentration of RC4 and normal C4, as you can see here from uh, previous uh, transparencies, for the, for the production of RC4 and normal C4, Fully are only possible you know, reaction loads. We, we are, you know, we can get IC4 or normal C4. And first one is uh, still from type A velocity, which which from the two to four uh, carbon ion, and which were resulting in two uh, isobutanes. And then for type B, as you can see from type B velocity, we will produce uh, equal amount of uh, normal butane and isobutane. And from C, we produce you know, only isobutanes. Uh, I'm sorry, only normal butanes. So, uh, now let's look at the real products we get. Actually, here I show the ratio. And the ratio of isobutane to normal butane. And as I just showed you in previous, uh, previous uh, transparencies, if we have only type A, a better stations. So the products are only isobutane. So the ratio of isobutane to normal butane should be maximum, it's very, very high. But here it's not very, very high, so you can see the full. And also, uh, since it's very interesting, in, for different uh, zeolites, we get uh, very different uh, ratios. Uh, and, but, but now, probably, uh, you may have questions of where, you know, whether are those IC4 and non c 4 are truly from those better city reactions. Probably uh, we may also have like uh, uh, interconversion between isobutane and normal butane. If this happens, so this figure is meaningless, I and mean, this can tell us nothing. And with this in mind, I, I did some more experiments on the those, on our catalyst for the pure iso isobutane, and to try to see whether we have any reactions or I mean any interconversion between isobutane and the normal butane. From this uh, table, you can see a typical reaction condition. You know, for me uh, to do isomeric reactions uh, to 90 degree. Combustion for the isobutane to whatever products you know, which include the isomeric product and the decarbonization product, are very small. You can see here 0.9, this is only 0.2, and this is even 0.1. This is even 
of our modernized is still our friend, finite. So we can exclude the possibility of any interconversion between absolute and normal beauty. So and now let me go back to the previous uh, transparency, see what we can get based on this fee. And as you can see here, uh, obviously uh, for the artist of Y, they realize, as you can see, because the relative high uh, ratio of ISO C4 to normal C4, certainly uh, we, we can see there are a lot of type A beta C things that are happening, or they are responsible for the relative high ratios. And uh, however, of the high silica zeolites, like the SM12, and the uh, high silica beta zeolite, which is beta with silica alumination ratio of 132, and uh, the, the ratio as equal to normal C4 starting relatively low, and uh, people obviously see it all changes slightly with the temperature. So we can see for those for this region of zeolites, the type A, B, and the C beta stations are e equally important. And however, for this region of zeolites, type A beta stations are playing the dominant role. And now I would like to adjust uh, to my study for the time of strain behavior. And for this figure, I show you um, the time of strain behavior of uh, this and toil and uh, artistable Y uh, over uh, about 1,000 hour period. Uh, as you can see here, for this and toil, uh, the activity does not change so much <coughs> over such a long period of time. However, in comparison with the artistable, artistable Y, uh, you can see here, this is activity will go down very fast in about only 30 hours, 50% uh, of its activity is already lost. Uh, this is uh, corresponding uh, uh, the isomer selectivity of the changes with time. And in another experiment, I want to show you some more zeolites. And here I use a net phenic mixture at relative high temperatures. This gives us you know, even severe cooking conditions. As you can see, still, this is 12. Uh, here I have two this 12, this is 12, 54, this is silica aluminum ratio 34, and this is 12, 35. Um, they are still the best catalysts when compared with other catalysts, like modernite, but this is which they are given in only a few hours, and also artist of white, this one, and even air they are like. <coughs> So in order to understand why uh, this toy is the best uh, catalyst uh, for the town spin behavior, we studied the, uh, what are changes during the reaction for the acidic size. And in this one, and in this experiment, uh, we use uh, <coughs> Chevron industrial uh, olefinic mixture uh, feed as a variation, and also relatively low hydrogen for oil uh, ratio. So the, the activation is really fast. You, as you can see, over about three hours, this three hour time stream uh, simple. Uh, for the, this is a fresh catalyst, so this is the deactivated catalyst. As you can see, for over beta zeolite, uh, about 50% uh, of acid size have uh, uh, already lost. In comparison with the uh, this toil, as you can see here, uh, we got two this toil. And over three hour period, uh, we do not see uh, so much uh, decrease in acidic sites available for the reaction. And so we uh, uh, carefully look at uh, the structure difference for this uh, zeolite. <coughs> and, and you can look at uh, for this one. This is this one 12. This is the structure. And we believe the, the difference is due to the very delicate difference in the zero structure. This is this one 12. It's almost a linear structure. We know it's uh, one dimensional, and it's almost a linear structure. And uh, when you compare it with uh, the structure of air zeolite, we know it's also a one dimensional zeolite, and uh, it's not a very good catalyst, or I mean, it's uh, not very stable. And you can see a difference here. Air zeolite, although it's dimensional, it's also one dimensional. But you can see the channel size is here, 7.1 angstrom. It's about from here to here. However, there is, you know, as you can see, periodically uh, expansion along the channel. For example, this uh, one expansion here, uh, here. The 
the dimension of the largest dimension in this cavity is 12.6 angstrom, which is much larger than air light. So we believe you know, this uh, cavity creates some space for the coping precursor to stay for a long time and uh, become bigger and bigger and uh, plug in the reaction. Plug in the light. And here I show you, show you uh, a schematic for the reaction, you know, the activation reaction happening inside of this zero force. And then starting with a normal octane, and for less than 12, it has no space for the cooking precursor state, so they will push it out. And however, over this zero light, Air zero light due to this you know, periodic expansion. So if there is one uh, cooking process stays there, it will stuck inside the then it will become larger and larger due to relative longer resonance time. And with, with this, uh, we get the following conclusions. And first of all, uh, catalyst activity. And this one is the most active um, uh, when we you know, have a similar aluminum ratio, and the uh, LZ is just the uh, active catalyst. And the normal, and the product distribution here uh, is the isometric product distribution at the relative high reaction conversions or temperatures, which are governed are controlled by thermodynamic equilibrium, and uh, the space uh, constraint imposed by uh, particular zero channels. And then the aluminum contents will determine which type of velocity reaction are playing the role. And for zeolites with relative high concentration, like or just Y, have a velocity uh, is dominating at the low temperature. And uh, the low aluminum contents, uh, all the velocity reaction are important. And finally, this M12 uh, demonstrates uh, superior constraint stability. And we believe this is due to its unique form structure. Uh, I think that's all. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, all that questions, uh, any questions you may have. What template did you use for your CSM-12? I guess the reason I'm asking is that our experience, it's hard to get silica illumination as low as you have for CSM-12. How do you know that all the aluminum is in the structure? Uh, you, you mean uh, how we sense the or how we do reaction? What do you use as a template to make ZSM 12 You made the ZSM 12 yourself? Uh, yeah. We, we use tetraloid uh, ethyl ammonia bromide. And we do, we, we, we make this as according to the uh, patterns from Rosinski and Ruby. And we use 40 days for the census time. And yeah, the, the evidence that the all the aluminum is in the structure is based on your ammonia TDE? Uh, yes, we also did an actual uh, NMR experiment. From the NMR experiment, we found that uh, there is no any octahedral alumina, particularly for the high, highly de-aluminated system 12. For the, you know, Original synthesized system 12, we found that very small peak uh, for the octahedral coordinated alumina. So we believe they are all in framework. Any other questions? Okay, so let's thank one minute again. Okay.